Betsy, Marguerite, Cheryl, Catherine, John, Lisa, Susan, Christina, Sandra, Lynn, Marcia, Victor, Michelle, and Mike. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, and I appreciate the willingness to zoom me in. Um, I really enjoy doing these kinds of things. Uh, we're going to talk about the seven virtues of the online instructor, try to have a little fun, but also uh, provide some information that will be useful to you. Somebody said to me, what do you mean, there's only seven deadly sins? And I said, well, uh, we're going to talk about the virtues, not the deadly sins. But uh, uh, you look back at the, the history of all of this, and I think Michelle has probably given you all a copy or will give you a copy of the short uh, white paper that I wrote about this, uh, this topic. Um, can someone mute their microphone, please? We can hear you typing. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, does anybody remember who this guy is? Know who this guy is? No. Come on. Think back. Think of your favorite movies. Think, think of your favorite stage plays. I don't know. Does anyone else know? Here's a hint. Music man. Here's a hint. Liberace. Yeah, you got it. Here in River City. Music man. Hey, I'm taking credit for that. I said that. <laughs> Fun, huh? Uh, the Music Man, Harold Hill, played by Robert Preston, Shirley Jones, uh, Buddy Hackett was Marcellus Washburn. Do you remember the story? This guy come rolling into town, and he was going to sell him a bill of goods. It was a band, and he told them that they could become proficient basically without practicing. He was a snake oil salesman. Well, uh, you may wonder, whoops, we don't want to see that again. You may wonder, who the heck am I? <laughs> well, some of you at the end of this may think I'm a snake oil salesman uh, zooming into uh, your lives for a half an hour or so to talk about something. Um, I've been a prof let, let me tell you who I am. I've been a professor for now more than 40 years. Got my degree from the University of Iowa in 1975. Um, reminds me of another story I'll tell you later. My friends all tell me, don't tell jokes, Mike. You're not any good at it, so I won't tell you jokes. I'll tell you stories. Um, here's my website, and you can see the uh, URL at the bottom. I have literally hundreds of references, resources, documents, podcasts, video podcasts, all linked there. They're all available for you to use, uh, download, with or without attribution. I don't care. I want you just to make take advantage of these materials um, if you uh, feel so inclined. Um, I was a professor at Iowa State University for 25 years, ran a research institute, did all the things that traditional professors do, including say to one of my doctoral students who was interested in studying distance education, that that was something, distance education, was something that Community colleges did, but universities didn't do that. Uh, she's never let me forget it. Um, Susan Zavacek, uh, someone I'll mention more in a few minutes, helped me understand that this phenomena what, that we all are living and a part of today uh, was predicted, predictable. Um, and since she helped me understand what distance education was really all about. She did a dissertation and I supervised it. I have begin to, begun to study this phenomena. And so from the perspective of a, a scholar or a scientist or a researcher, that's the perspective I'd like to share with you. Now, I'm also a teacher, so we'll share it from that perspective also. Um, a little bit about where I work, that's sort of the, comes with the territory. Um, Nova Southeastern University is one of the largest, least known universities in the country. It's in Miami Beach, or excuse me, my, my campus, beautiful downtown North Miami Beach. I can see the ocean from uh, one of the windows on the top floor, not from my office, um, with its main campus in Davie, Florida, which is a suburb of Fort Lauderdale. It's got a 70-acre campus. 
uh, 26,000 students got a law school, a medical school, a school of oceanography. As a matter of fact, if you ever take a cruise out of uh, uh, Port Lauderdale, Port Lauderdale Port, uh, you'll go right by the huge oceanographic center right there on uh, the exit from the harbor out into the ocean. Um, but nobody's heard of us. Uh, one of the reasons is I, I think it's because we don't have a Division One football or basketball team. But I've been here for 15 years now, and I've been able to work in the Fischler School of Education and in the Instructional Technology and Distance Education doctoral program. We have about 300 students, uh, mostly taught at a distance um, from around the country, around the world. Uh, and there's some notable people. There's one in this in this uh, Zoom room with, uh, with us who are uh, graduates of that program and could probably talk about it. But but uh, the interesting thing for this presentation about Nova Southeastern is it's a university that started 50 years ago, pretty much on a shoestring as an alternative to the traditional bricks and mortar university. Online education was something that even back then was attempted and was practiced, distance education, certainly using other technologies. But now it's moved back towards the mainstream, towards the traditional bricks and mortar university, not at the exclusion of the online approach, distance education approach, but to supplement it. And so there's interesting phenomena going on that uh, is kind of fun to observe for somebody like me. Okay, where do I get my expertise to come to you for a half an hour and say these are seven things that you ought to consider? Well, uh, on the left, you can see the textbooks. As a matter of fact, I've got the copies of them right back behind me. Say, do you like my two uh, cameras? Is, is my other camera still on back here? Were you yeah, it is working, and um, I just want to remind Maja, who's joined us, can you mute? Oh, I see you just did it. Thanks so much. Yeah, we can see you. Good. Uh, I see my back end and my front end. <laughs> I want you to make sure that you know I'm a real person and not a, uh, a something animated. Uh, I'd like to think this is the best-selling textbook in the field for people that want to be distance educators. It's in its sixth edition. Um, uh, published by uh, Information Age Publishing, formerly by Pearson. Uh, there's also a book that one of my associates here and I collaborated on. Dr. Anna Miroriana was the lead author. Oh, there you go. There's the fourth edition, right? Good for you. You keep it around all the time. Uh, <laughs> uh, put you to sleep at night. Uh, titled The Perfect Online Course. Now, that's a little pretentious of us, presumptuous of us, but there's a lot of good information in here from which I have extracted these seven points that we're going to talk about. Plus, I stay current by editing two journals. Uh, one is called the Distance Learning Journal, and this is sort of the Practitioner's Journal. This is one that uh, uh, publishes how we do things in our school or our program, and the other is a scholarly refereed journal that talks about the research in the field. So, writing these things and playing golf and doing presentations to folks like you is kind of keeps me pretty busy and working in our doctoral program. But that's sort of my background. Um, it's interesting to study this phenomenon of distance education where a professor who thought he knew an awful lot, obviously didn't, 15 or 20 years ago said that distance education was a flash in the pan and for somebody else, not us. I also teach at a distance. Here's some pages I pulled out of my Blackboard uh, course, one of the courses that I teach. I'm a devotee, an advocate of the unit module topic approach. I'll say a little more about that, but basically units are roughly equivalent to semester credits. Uh, modules are subdivisions of units and topics or the key ideas within the modules as a way to structure our courses instead of on the typical 50-minute class period of time. Um, I use a lot of videos. I do a lot, use a lot of alternative media, embed them, some not embedded, use uh, Vimeo and uh, really have a lot of fun with this distance learning thing. And I, I hope that most of you will agree, once you get over the hump of how do I do it and what works and what doesn't work, and maybe even read the literature so we know what works and what doesn't work, we don't have to just use trial and error, it's kind of an interesting way to teach. Certainly not to replace other forms of education, but as one of the options in our cornucopia of options um, that uh, ought to be considered. Um, okay, let's talk about these seven virtues uh, and avoiding the seven deadly sins. Don't ask me how I came up with this. I don't spend all my time talking about deadly sins, and, I, and my friends would verify that I don't talk about virtuousness 
all that much either. But but let's talk about each one in turn and, and give some examples. Um, first, the virtue of humility. And I'll, I'll let you guess, if you have the paper in front of me, what is humility the option for as related to the sin? And, and by the way, studying the background of this, the the seven deadly sins were identified by the church, and instead of emphasizing sins you should avoid, the church said, well, let's come up with what we should strive for, and humility was something that should be uh, a virtue that we should all strive for. In online education, we're attempting here to overcome the sense of pride, and I'm probably as guilty of this as anyone because the key idea here is to avoid the talking head, and what the heck am I doing? Um, I'm sitting here in my cubicle and I'm a talking head. I'd like to think that the visuals that I'm using and the audio that I'm sharing with you and maybe the handout if you've got a copy and maybe the white paper that you have a copy are alternatives. But we often talk about avoiding the talking head and that doesn't mean we shouldn't lecture. That just means we shouldn't only lecture. Just like we shouldn't only use videos or we shouldn't only use PowerPoint slides or, or we shouldn't only do one approach. We should mix our delivery of instruction content uh, using either the most appropriate or the most applicable or the most convenient technology for us. That's why uh, a lot of people, including from what Michelle has told me, a lot of you think uh, is why Zoom is so nifty. I mean, here we are miles, thousands of miles apart and it's almost like we're all together. Uh, the next uh, virtue is charity. Charity is the virtue that's designed to be counter to the sin of greed. So what do we mean by that? When we teach, keep the length appropriate. There is a body of literature that talks at considerable length about how we ought to chunk instruction, scientific word, it's in the literature, how we should trunk and chunk instruction around single concept teaching. If you remember back to your psychology class in college, you know, that large lecture hall with 300 people in it, and if you had a really good professor, after the lecture was over, you could look at the chalkboard and you could see the six or seven main ideas that that professor had lectured about and written about on the chalkboard. Or if your professor didn't use the chalkboard, you probably, if they were very good at structuring their lectures, you could see the five or six or seven key ideas, key single concepts that that professor presented as evidenced in your note taking. So what do we talk about single concepts? Single basic idea that can be explained uh, with still motion, video, audio, a three to five minutes long. Actually, this slide is an example of a single concept, talking about single concepts. Part of a series often, in other words, they're cumulative, they build upon one another. They may be learning objects, MPEG-3, MPEG-4. Isn't it fun we've learned all this new jargon, all these three and four letter code groups. Uh, stored for retrieval. We can use things over again because they're stored electronically and they can be easily updated. Uh, obviously, one of the advantages of the digital world is that we can think things relatively uh, quickly in a relatively straightforward way. This is not a new idea. Single concept teaching has been around a long time. I don't know how old you all are, but if you, any of you have been around even the last 30 years in education, you may remember single concept films in science classes. They were little plug-in eight millimeter movies that would show mitosis, you know, cell division. Um, but there was considerable research in the scientific community about this idea of single concepts films. And the, the, uh, the physics field published a lot of literature about this particular idea. Um, you have an introduction, you have an explanation, you have an example, and you have a summary that leads into the next introduction or the next introduction. Now, today we would call that a podcast, maybe, or we would call it a, a learning object or a learning experience. But when you think about how you structure in your teaching, our teaching, especially online, where the artifact of teaching is what is left for the students 
to study, not what they've learned, but what they use to study, the single concepts are the building blocks. Uh, patience is the virtue to oppose the sin of wrath. Doesn't do any good to get mad at them. So when we talk about patience, interaction is what we're talking about here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about interaction. Probably one of the most discussed, in, in my opinion, in the opinion of the literature, uh, least understood of the critical elements of effective online teaching. Interaction is important, but it's not all important. Now, right now, I'm not interacting very much at all, although I'm looking here. Uh, oh, I see somebody gets the distance learning journal. That's good. I'm going to come back and go through the uh, uh, chat discussions so, and, and answer questions and, and see what people have uh, posted there. So post things while I'm talking. But interaction is often identified on a continuum from soft interaction to hard interaction. Now, let me say what I mean by that. Soft interaction might be something called the interactive study guide. And this is a, a note-taking strategy that Tom Sears and a couple of other people came up with, where instead of just giving people copies of your PowerPoint slides, if you're lecturing to them at a distance or in a regular classroom, you leave key elements out so that the students have to fill in the blanks. I realize that's silly, but it is an example of, could be considered silly, is an example of soft interaction because the students have to interact with you in order to get the PowerPoint slides, the notes, what they will be studying after the lecture, after the presentation, down so they have all the content. Now, the interactive study guide is what would go on the blanks right here. Let's talk a little bit more about those interactive study guides. What's the purposes? Well, the purpose of the interactive study guide is to focus student attention. They serve as advanced organizers. They minimize student note copying and encourage more note taking and note participation, and they encourage interaction and discussion. So you, you take your PowerPoint slides, your prezies, um, your handouts, and you leave key elements out so that students have to pay attention to what you're saying as they complete that learning object, that, uh, that uh, a single concept that they're gonna study later uh, after class, outside of class. Here's some other examples. Oftentimes, uh, in the interactive study guide, we want to use um, the word picture. In other words, we don't have a, just a list of words, but we try to make a graphical reference to what it is we're talking about. Focus the attention, purpose of uh, uh, focus attention on the instruction. They're the key element of the lesson, and they eliminate note copying. And they let students interact a little bit more. Now, this, as I said, an example of soft interaction. So when students interact with, with other students, that's moving up the continuum. Um, students interacting with the instructor, that's moving up the continuum further. And at the, at the hard end of the continuum, from soft interaction to hard interaction, is students interacting with, with groups of people. In other words, where students are learning together through the process of interacting, not just asking either someone questions or being uh, directed by someone, but rather there is a learning community that's formed. And by the way, the literature on learning community says seven is the magic number plus or minus two. So if you're dividing your class into learning groups, you know, bluebirds and robins and, and parakeets, divide them into groups of five or six or seven. Um, less than five, the group probably isn't interacting very well in a group project, more than Oh, eight or nine, probably the group is going to be subdivided and not going to be a true learning group. Also, literature is pretty clear about that. Oh, let me back up. I went too fast. Uh, uh, more than just word pictures, but also graphics that can be used. And now that, once again, this is an example of soft interaction because the student is interacting, interacting with materials as they participate in a lesson. And it's a way to get you started and your students started in this realizing that it's not just the, the presentation of information that happens in a course, in an online course or a traditional course for that matter, but it's the participation of the student that is of critical importance. Okay, let's go uh, to our next uh, deadly sin and our next 
diligence wards off the sin of sloth. What's sloth? Well, that's laziness, apathy. Um, in other words, it's once we've taught something enough times, it's relatively easy to go in and wing it, isn't it? We can just go in and say, well, I know all about this particular topic, so I'm just going to go talk about this particular topic. Uh, that's why this whole concept of planning and organizing and spending time thinking about how you can metaphorically, analytically convey ideas about the subject that you're teaching to students. And I've got a couple of uh, hard and fast suggestions I'll come up with here in a second. That's why I like the unit module topic approach. Remembering again, the typical college course is three semester credits, give or some, some are one, some are five, but generally there are three. A three semester credit course uh, implies that um, a student is going to spend about 45, 50 minute hours studying the contents of that unit. Let me say that again. 45, 50 minute hours studying the contents of that unit. Think about it, you know, like, let, let me grab, uh, let me grab this textbook. Textbooks are often organized around units. Um, the first unit here is called Foundations of Distance Education. The second is called Teaching and Learning at a Distance. And the third uh, unit of this textbook for a three semester credit course is titled Managing and Evaluating Distance Education. Textbook authors are pretty good at organizing things around semester credits because semester credits uh, are how courses are taught that use their textbooks. Why 50-minute class sessions? Well, think back to what we know about the Carnegie unit or the course unit at the college level. If you're taking a three-semester credit class at the uh, City College of New York, pick one, and it's a face-to-face -face class, what do you do? You go to class Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 9 o'clock uh, for 50 minutes, don't you? And then class is over. And for every hour you're in class, you're expected to spend a couple of minutes outside of class, a couple of hours outside of class. Well, a couple of minutes is what some students think, but a couple of hours outside of class. So for every three semester credit class, you're going to have, well, three times 15 weeks, 45 class sessions, and you're supposed to spend about twice that much time outside of class studying. Studying the lecture notes, studying the textbook, writing papers, doing projects, collaborating with your learning group. So, since we're not organizing our classes around face-to-face -face class sessions, how do we organize them? The unit, each divided into three or four major week-long modules, each divided into three or four critical single concepts. Unit module topic approach. Kindness. Okay, that was kind of a lecture right there, wasn't it? I, did, I, did I get into my lecture mode? I, I went back and I rolled my fingers and stuff. I was in my lecture mode there. So let's, let's talk about kindness. This is to avoid the envy of sin. <laughs> what am I going to talk about here? Well, okay, design for your audience, not for yourself. Most of us enjoy teaching. Uh, we wouldn't be doing it for very long because it's a lot of work. And so... When we teach, we kind of like to do the things we like to do, right? And, and I'm guilty of that. But when we design instruction, let's try to design it for our audience. Now, that makes sense. But one of the areas we ought to consider is this topic of visual literacy. How can we convey ideas using sense, the senses other than basically the verbal, which is written, which is... Um, Am I still on? Yeah, visual literacy. Written, uh, spoken words. Um, visual literacy is defined as the ability to communicate ideas through design. This, this research is relatively hard to pin down, but if you just look at the physics of eyesight, it's about eight times as robust. The visual spectrum is eight or more times as wide as the audible spectrum, if you're just looking at sound versus vision, if you go to your chart of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, and so there's ability to communicate more information through the sense of sight if we use it effectively. Uh, most of us are interested in retention. There is a lot of research that shows this. If, if 
we shut all the visuals off and I lectured to you and, I, and, and Michelle gave you a test three hours from now, you'd be able to get about 20% of the answers correct without any intervening study. And I didn't give you any materials. Uh, if I visualize it and have pictures and ideas and Michelle gave you a test three hours from now without any intervening study, you remember about 50%, maybe as much as 70%. Now, obviously, the mitigating force here is the concept of study. You know, we spend time studying. And by the way, the research that shows that distance education is more effective in terms of achievement than traditional education is critically flawed if that's all you listen to. What the research has clearly demonstrated is when distance education students achieve better than traditionally taught students, there's one factor that is critical. The distance students report they spend more time on the topics than the traditional students do. Let me say that again. Distant students generally report that they spend more time on the course, on the topics, on the units, on the modules, than traditional students do. And that is correlated directly with these differences in achievement. Now, hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? Why do they? Well, maybe there's a lot of reasons for that, and that's another lecture for another day. But uh, here, here's a fun one. I don't know if the, the detail on this is very good. Look over my shoulder. This was on the uh, uh, an attempt at visual literacy on Pioneer 9, I think, spacecraft that got launched. And, and since there was no audio, I think uh, Voyager in the Star Trek movie, that was a laser disc they sent with the bumps on it. And it, it used binary numbers and it used draft drawings and graphics. And so the whole concept of visual literacy is not just something that we teachers use. It's also been uh, documented in the scientific literature. Here's an example of a visual analogy. Media are like delivery trucks. They predict the delivery of ideas to learners. Matter of fact, there's a, a guy named Richard Clark who has made a, a career by supporting this content, uh, th this, this analogy that media are mere vehicles and it's the content that's critical, not the medium that you use, but that's again, another lecture for another day. Let's talk about the next deadly sin and virtue, temperance. This is one that uh, I probably need to pay attention to. Uh, gluttony is the sin, temperance is the virtue. Is that spelled right? I guess it is. Um, avoid lecturing. Ah, okay, You're <laughs> I've hit on this again. Uh, it's easy to say, avoid the talking head, avoid lecturing, but what do we do instead? Okay, three ideas, triggers, visual analogies, and word pictures. I already talked a little bit about visual analogies, a little bit about word pictures. We're gonna talk about triggers also. What's a trigger? And well, we'll come back to that in a second. A word picture, cause and effect, the water cycle. Well, you know, isn't that pretty clear once you See that? It's not entirely scientifically accurate in all cases, but it kind of gives you the idea where rain comes from, for example, um, in addition to a verbal explanation. Uh, then there are the trigger videos. These are one of my favorites. I've discovered uh, since probably digital video production has become so relatively easy. We've all got our iPhones. We've all got our Zoom cameras. We've all got our web cameras. Many of us even have digital video cameras. So it's relatively easy to produce a trigger video. The definition is right here. Let me show you an example of one I think this will show. This is kind of fun. That one of my friends up in the uh, University of Maryland produced. Can you hear? Many, many times. Dr. Dooley, I apologize for being late. I was tied up I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't wait. I need to get started. Okay, I got lots of four patients. I'm just going to go get scrubbed in. Go get scrubbed. Hurry up. Did we switch patients? Or did we, are we still on the normal OR schedule? No, this is still James. You know that. You're still first case. You don't change patients. Steve Shadiak. I swore I consented him last night for a left knee exploration. I'm almost positive, a left knee exploration, and I have it in my notes as being a left knee as well. Where's the chart? Give me the chart. I hope this is. Well, I hope, I hope you're wrong. 
Wasn't that fun? Uh, now, the, obviously, this was done in a, a a clinical lab or a clinical training lab. And and uh, when I first saw this, and I asked if I could use it in some of my classes, and I showed it to some of the nursing students and others that I've taught, I said, I, I realize this is totally out of the realm of possibility. And before I got the realm of possibility out, they were all saying, no, 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 <laughs> this kind of thing happens all the time. Uh, not all the time. Uh, but, but the trigger video then presents a scenario, an idea, but doesn't provide the solution. What happens afterwards is the discussion, the, uh, the explanation, the small group, the hard interaction that occurs after a critical idea has been presented. Uh, and trigger then triggers the thought, triggers the discussion. Now, that one was probably produced with uh, university videographers, but we've produced a number of them, including a real classic one on plagiarism, where we just set up a camera and a student walked in and was he had been accused that on uh, of plagiarism, his turn it in score was 70, and he said, the other guy copied me, not I copied them. And so the professor was left with that dilemma again. Uh, once again, this was, what, about three to five minutes long, not even that long, probably, where it triggered the idea. Somebody asked me, or maybe you're asking yourselves, uh, where did the idea of trigger come from? Uh, well, it triggers ideas, not trigger the horse. I first saw my first ones. I, I don't know if Michelle told you this. I, I spent four years in the Marine Corps from, six, from 68 to 72. And the first trigger video I saw was actually a trigger 16 millimeter film and the, the enemy unseen was attacking a hill on which there were about 15 Marines dug in and the sergeant came to the lieutenant and said, we're out of ammunition, we're being overrun. What now, lieutenant? And then <laughs> the film ended and uh, these 421 year old testosterone laden Marine second lieutenants then discussed what they would do. <laughs> but it was an idea, it, it is an idea that has been used in a lot of situations where there may not be a right answer or the right answer is not something you want just to present, but you want people to think about it, to look at the critical elements, to discussion, to analyze. And, and I, I think the trigger videos where you present a scenario, especially real world scenarios, are really kind of interesting. Let's look at the last of the seven deadly sins and the seven virtues, and it's chastity. Yes, chastity. Uh, we want to counter the sin of lust. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, purity is maybe a better than chastity. We, we're promoting purity. Uh, what do we mean by that? Rigor, demand quality. Uh, we want to convey by what we do this idea of quality and scientific and academic rigor in our teaching and convey that to my students. And that's something that all of us think. We all try to do that. When we get into a distance environment, and especially if we're teaching students we don't get a chance to see regularly, sometimes if ever, this is something that we need to constantly think about. And by, and by the way, remember, you are not an actor. You are a teacher. You're a professor. You just are a teacher who plays an actor when you make videos. <laughs> so, so we don't have to be always have the highest production standards. As a matter of fact, the research that we look at say students kind of, I don't know, kind of poo-poo that. They say, oh, if it's something that's commercially produced, that in some cases, kind of removes it from the real world of my class and my teacher and my fellow classmates. 
So possibly we don't have to think about the highest production standards as long as we meet the minimum production standards. And I've got a nice little video that's on my website that talks about the 10 recommendations for, for producing and teaching uh, in live webinars. Once again, it's the message that is, that's important. I, I, I've got to tell you a story at this point. Um, my first professional presentation was the results of my dissertation. And it was 1976. It was in New Orleans. It was at one of the hotels in the French Quarter. And my presentation was on Thursday, the last day of the conference, or next to last day of the conference, there was keynotes the next day. And it was like 4.30 in the afternoon. So I walked down to the convention area of the hotel. I had my armload of overhead transparencies. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. And it, I, I walked into the room five minutes early, and there was one person in the room, one person there. Well, naturally, I was disappointed. I kind of waited around a little bit, kind of like Michelle did before this presentation started and said, uh, uh, let's see if some more people show up. And, and obviously, I'm looking at the gallery view and there's what, 20 of you there, 15 of you, which is pretty good turnout for something like this. Um, but after a while, no, after three or four minutes, nobody else showed up. So I said to myself, you know, I'm going to do my level best. I'm going to give the best presentation I can for this guy because he came to my session. So I gave my presentation. I think I got 20 minutes. They were setting up the cocktail bar out in the hallway and moving in the tables in the little high chairs. And you could kind of hear them out there. But this guy and I, I gave my presentation. When I got down my transparencies. I, I said, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for being here. You don't know how much it means to me. And he got this horrified look on his face. And he looked me in the eye and says, please don't leave. I'm next on the program. Well, <laughs> I guess there is no next on the program, but how far have I come? Now, there's nobody. I'm in my cubicle in North Miami Beach, and you guys are all there little boxes on my screen uh, with little uh, arrows through. But, but, but think about that for a second. That's kind of what we do with teachers, isn't it? We love this opportunity that we have to uh, share information with people. By the way, that guy and I became uh, fast friends uh, we would run into each other at sessions. His session was pretty good. I think his session was a little better than mine. And uh, uh, we've always chuckled about that encounter that we both had. Well, that's all I have to say. Let's, let me review very quickly. Be humble. Show charity. Be patient. Be diligent. Be kind. Be temperate. Try to be pure. <laughs> Sounds like a Boy Scout oath, doesn't it? Um, and one thing I'm sure you've mostly discovered by now is almost all of these recommendations are just as applicable to the face-to-face -face classroom as they are to the distant delivered classroom. And as a matter of fact, if there's one given in the literature in my 15 years, 20 years of studying distance education is, is that the principles that are good teaching, good pedagogy, good andragogy uh, are the same no matter what the delivery mechanism is. Now, they shouldn't be identical. They need to be equivalent. We need to modify them. We need to think about how the technology allows us to interact or operate. But the basic ideas remain the same. Thank you very much. I'll just respond to any questions now, Michelle. Great. Thank you very much. Does um, Do any of you have any questions or um, want to Ask about any ideas or anything you want. Uh, never forget the Sharpie when you are the patient. Ah, good. They mark your leg, don't they? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's fun. So I'm going to open this up. Just turn on your mic and go ahead, or you can put a comment in the, um, the chat box as well. Somebody's going back to the store to buy more winter, winter labels. Hey, this yeah. is uh, Kirsty Michelle. <laughs> and, Great. Uh, yeah. Um, one of the one of the things that you know I was thinking about your media image with the with the truck, and I think that there are so many different um, uh, elements available to us um, in terms of uh, media delivery. But I think it's a it's a challenge. We have a population that um, in our program, we our nursing program, um, which is completely asynchronous, and that may not be of a, a, a traditional age. So um, 
very often we have students that are not very technologically savvy, although I'm starting to see that change. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are many um, things that I see out in the, uh, either at conferences or um, stuff that I just explore and find on my own for delivery of media. Uh, but, you know, we're becoming more and more app based. What do you think about getting students to um, think seriously about a mobile device before they come to um, a completely asynchronous program? Because there's a lot of app based stuff that I'd really like to tell them to go do, but I can't because we can't demand that right now. That's a good question. Um, uh, by the way, I do a lot of work with schools of nursing. I'm not, not only here at uh, Nova Southeastern, but I'm I'm working uh, for the last three and a half years with the U of M University of Miami School of Nursing, who who has taken their uh, RN to BSN, BSN to RN, whatever the order is, uh, and and made it totally online and done a lot of work with them. The nurses, by the way, are leading the health professions when it comes to. Uh, use of technology and effective teaching, both distance education and classroom-based. When you look at the health professions, um, followed very closely by the occupational and physical therapists, believe it or not, who, who are now moving almost uh, like, like, like fast and furious uh, into blended uh, doctoral and master's programs for, for physical therapists and occupational therapists. Think about that for a second. I mean, most of us wouldn't think physical therapy would be taught at a distance. Well, it's not all taught at a distance, but a lot of it is. Um, yeah, um, what the U of M is doing is they're requiring students to uh, use apps and, and uh, requiring students to have an iPad, iPhone, or some other kind of uh, pad that, that is compatible with the materials they're using. When they and then when they implemented that, they found that they didn't need to. They didn't get any pushback at all because ninety four percent of their students already have those devices, and they just had not thought about using them. Um, my iPhone back here, that's showing me now. That's a pretty simplistic use of an iPhone, but uh, that that device is as powerful as most of the computer, or just as powerful as many of the computers we have on our desktops today. So. So the, the whole idea of the older professional, the doctoral student, the average student in our doctoral program, the average age when they start is 43. When they graduate, it's like 47. They all say they feel like they're 77 uh, when they're done. But, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these urban myths about the kids are better at it than the grownups or the, the younger generation, the millennials are better at it than the uh than the baby boomers, you know, that's not true at all. Uh, they're all equally as good or bad, um, depending upon who they are. So, um, especially in professions like nursing and some of the other health professions, boy, the, the technologies that need to be used, that nurses are leading the way, kicking the, the MDs and the DOs in the rear end and saying, listen, we've got to get to electronic record keeping. We have to, we have, to have the uh, visual devices. We have to use the uh, telemedicine techniques um, are sort of inevitable. And so if, if we as the leaders, you as the leaders in your field, uh, promote it, it will become, might be difficult for people initially, but ultimately it's what they're going to be practicing in the real world also. Uh, I've got a nice unit in one of my courses on telemedicine. Telemedicine, telehealth is probably one of the, one of the exploding areas uh, in education generally and distance education specifically. Uh, hospitals and clinics and doctors in rural areas and doctors in urban areas, doctors, medical facilities, forget about the doctors. Um, yeah, big area. So go for it in my opinion. It is possible to make, um, we have software requirements. Students, for example, have to use certain types of software when they submit their assignments. I mean, you just have to make it a campus policy. Um, it's not impossible to do. Uh, it's just something that we'd have to discuss and decide what we felt was fair and appropriate to apply, and it would have to go through administration and whatnot, but it could be done down the line. Generally, how it's accomplished, uh, Michelle, by the way, is that Schools say, all right, a, a mobile device is a requirement. It's either an iPad or an iPhone, you know, that kind of thing. But then they make the commitment that they're going to purchase, not one for everybody, but a, a number. Uh, let's say if you've got 
100 students, they'll purchase 15 mobile devices. And tell students that if, for whatever reason, they can't financially afford to have one, they, they will be able for the duration of the program, as long as they're in good standing, to check out one of those devices. And what, the, what, what we found is that relatively few students choose that option. You have 100 students, you have 15 for checkout, they might check out two or three, and that after a short period of time, people want their own and they get their own, either for a Christmas present or something. So it's a transitory mm -hmm. thing. You don't yeah, just yeah. You've got to have it, but you, you try to uh, provide some assistance and pretty soon people all have their own. Kirsty, I just put a comment in the chat box about that. <clears throat> Okay, 800 graduating in 08, enforcing being sure. Yeah, the, the whole enforcement thing is probably uh, a, a fool's game. Um, and what, 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 what another approach is, this is an approach that, that is, is well documented in the literature, is when we design things, we have to over-design them. In other words, we, have, we should design them so they can be viewed on a mobile device like Blackboard. You know, you can, Blackboard has an app and you can see the videos, but also they need to be, uh, if you're making videos in .wmv format, that's for PCs, and .mov or MPEG-4 formats for your Macs. That's a lot of hassle, but it's relatively easy once you start doing it. And students can help with that. That's everybody, everybody says students can help with that. But when you have, you know, I've, I've, got, I've got 300 students, and I, they're all, they don't come to campus except in the, in the summer. And so we don't see them either. Uh, we have... We had, we still have, nobody's asked for them, laptops that we'd stick in the box and mail to somebody. I mailed one to Singapore. Um, that's an expense, and maybe that's a, maybe I'm kind of garnishing the lily a little bit about how, how that happens. And so, you know, maybe the logical thing to do is gradually transition from what you're doing now to what uh, the alternatives might be. I certainly would not be an advocate of doing everything on a mobile device. I mean, that's silly. Uh, but it is nice when I'm sitting having uh, at happy hour and, and my wife hasn't shown up yet. I get my iPhone out and I'll, <laughs> I'll look over the uh, videos that are in Blackboard that I've assigned to students to make sure that they run okay. And or I'll go to uh, Facebook on my iPhone and I'll look at the Facebook videos that I placed up there free of charge. Um, now, maybe that's why students are spending more time in that literature I talked about. Achievement goes up not because it's the medium is better. The medium is a mirror, mirror delivery strategy, but because, you know, you can sit at happy hour. My wife hasn't gotten there yet, so I've got my iPhone out, and I'll just check those videos, and that's what students do, too. <laughs> and not, not, a, not, not the best answer, uh, <laughs> Christy, but. Yeah, uh, Christy, that is commonly done where you can survey students and see what yeah. devices they have. Um, in a BYOD situation, usually what I would recommend is that you choose um, choose apps that, that are multi-device, like Evernote is a great app because yeah. they've got, it's pretty much works on any device, iOS, Android, you name it, and you can, you can get, you can use your Evernote from your PC, your Mac, I mean, you name whatever you have, type of computer, tablet, then um, they are changing rapidly, I agree, and surveying is difficult, and that's why survey we could survey now and in three months all the technology changes however if we choose apps like evernote that are already byod and manage that for us then that's maybe an easier and um more easily facilitated approach i don't know what do you think mike yeah well and, and, and you all my my class here you all have the advantage of having a michelle sitting there who is by any measure O overly eager to, eager to help you in any way she can. So take advantage of her and the people that work with her. Um, the survey is a great idea. U of M and the, and the uh, uh, physical therapy doctoral program that I've been working with recently did surveys of students and did surveys of the faculty too, of you guys, to find out what you have and what your home office looks like. Got an interesting research studies and, and a paper on, what, what, parenthetically speaking, on what your home office should be like. Each of you, when you work from your home, what should be the configuration and what should be included? Not as a mandate, but what, you know, is what uh, the science says is important. But the surveys do two things. They sort of alert people that, uh-oh, this is important. They're surveying to see what I have, and I don't have some of this stuff. I better find out what it is. 
And the same thing for students. It's a first step, one of the first steps to alert them that, all right, we're going to be moving into alternative ways. I, 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 if I don't know what a smartphone is, I maybe need to find out, students do, but, um, and not, maybe they never thought about it as a tool for a nurse in training. Uh, and that, that, that survey becomes then a, a tool for you to use when you go to administration also. Any other comments? Does anyone else want to say anything, ask anything, discuss anything? Will you do one last thing for me? I, I truly enjoy sitting ovation. So everybody turn their microphones on and clap for me, okay? <laughs> oh, All man. right. King's that song. Yeah. Okay. All right. Clap. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good idea. I love it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Really appreciate your time today. Um, I have that white paper that you sent me. I'm going to put it in our faculty lounge online for everybody. And we're also recorded this. So um, once we're done, we will send you the link to this video. And yeah, I appreciate that. Michelle, yes. can you also send me the MPEG file too, please? Uh, absolutely. When we're all done, we'll send that to you. I want to put it on my website also. So. Yep, yep, no problem. So thank you, everybody, for coming today, and thank you. And I'll thank let you know if we have any more questions. I'll send them and get some answers back you or bet. whatever. <laughs> if anybody wants to contact me one-on-one, -on -one, please feel free. Great. Thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for coming, All right, everybody. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Stay warm.